The issue of wage theft, as I was mentioned to Peak, and I'm always happy to, to, uh, to speak about, particularly in light of our experiences, can't really be um, looked at in isolation, like, like other things like this. We have had various experiences um, with not just wage theft, but uh, with young people who have been prepared to actually take the issue on, to stand up and to speak out, and uh, to do it in a very public way. And uh, we thought we might start with some of those young people themselves and um, hearing from them directly and their experiences. In 2015-2016, I was uh, contacted uh, by a couple of those young people, and one in particular, Ashley Mouncer, who was a university student at Wollongong uh, University, and uh, she was being ripped off, which is not uncommon, as we now know, obviously, for many young people. Um, and for others. But uh, she did something different with that. She decided to ask her friends and others at the university if they'd had similar experiences. But she didn't stop there. She used her networking and research skills and asked everybody to come back with rate of pay, their occupation, the name of their employer, and believe it or not, their employer's mobile number. If we could have, we would have employed her on the spot. They were fantastic skills for a young worker and guts in doing what she did. That led to an avalanche, basically, and a huge lid being lifted on the scourge of wage theft, which we knew existed, but it was notoriously difficult to actually get young people to come forward. In short, and we'll get onto the detail in a tick, but that always stands as our main case study because within the radius of three kilometres and 90% of which in two main streets in the centre of Wollongong started with 50 and became 80 businesses underpaying. That's just the ones we knew of. 80 within essentially two, two main streets in Wollongong. It became a three month research project and special investigation for the Sydney Morning Herald and became an, a, a four or five page expose on a Saturday paper and the cover edition and known as the Great Student Swindle. So we thought we might start with, um, if that's okay Pete, with Ashley and uh, Brianna and a couple of her friends. they're doing the right thing by you because they'll replace you in two seconds and it can be sort of disheartening to realise that it's the same situation almost anywhere you go and you end up going into employment expecting to be treated, which is not a very good introduction to the workforce. Boss was only offering $15 now. an hour. As you get anyway, um, you switch to pay rent and gradually went up to $16 and then $17, and then was fine for being too expensive. Um, and that point I was with a waitress, and he was having people in for a trial that lasted up to 10 hours and never resulted in employment. You're really not valued as an employee at all. They don't care about you. They don't care if you're making your rent. They don't care if they're doing the right thing by you because they'll replace you in two seconds. And it can be sort of disheartening to realise that it's the same situation almost anywhere you go, and you end up going into employment expecting to be mistreated, which is not a very good introduction to the workforce. I was getting paid twelve dollars and forty-five cents an hour as a base rate, and then occasionally one and a half times loading. I thought the pay rate was unusually low, and I asked Mum about it, and she looked up the award and did a bit of investigating, and found that it was lower than it should have been. Um, we emailed the pay slip um, guy <laughs> um, and he replied saying it was part-time rate, 70%, um, because I was not classified as an adult worker and that it was legitimate through the business. When I found out that I was underpaid, um, 
I was really disappointed in the business considering that it was such a well-renowned restaurant. Um, comparing that to getting paid $18.50 at... In broad terms, um, what was happening was not an accident. What was happening was a systemic approach to doing business uh, principally in the service sector areas, but in others as well. And it was happening in a region which in the last 20 to 30 years had a massive injection of students, as many student towns in many regions around Australia had. What you get is thousands and thousands of students who are all looking for part-time and casual work to pay their way through. When I first came to Wollongong in the 1980s, there were 6,000 students and 23,000 steel workers. Now there's 6,000 steel workers and 23,000 students. Just to give you an indication, when I say 6,000 steel workers, I'm being generous if you add contractors and others. So what you've got is you've got a labour market right there. And we've done a, a larger write-up with some of the reasons behind this and uh, how that dynamic works with a student labour market. But essentially, what was happening is this. A lot of those restaurants and other service sector industries that grew along with the student population worked out pretty quick that their best bet was to actually employ those students. They knew that those students were looking for work, needed work, and were what I describe as transient workers. They're almost like a transient class. The students themselves knew that they weren't going to be doing this for life. The bosses knew that the students knew that they weren't going to be doing that for life. And what had happened was an ability for many of these employers to say, well, unemployment in regional areas in particular is very high. You're not going to have many chances getting work anywhere else other than here. So you had the perfect conditions there and there, basically, to get an exploitable pool of labour. But that wasn't a sufficient condition. That was necessary, but not sufficient. In the last 20 years, you've also seen a dramatic reduction in the regulation of a lot of those workplaces. The combination of the attacks on the rights of organised labour of unions, their representatives, to actually inspect books, to enter premises and to essentially ensure compliance have been restricted through uh, draconian legislation. Waves one, two, three and then of course work choices. At the same time, you also had a broader ethos which is the idea of cutting red tape and cutting corners and making things more flexible. The flexibility agenda, as we say. And the flexibility agenda was, well, let's make things so complicated that no one can work out what the deal is. Essentially, it was Rafferty's rules. So much so that many of these small businesses, as you heard there, were making up things like part-time rates. What's a part-time rate? You're either a permanent or you're casual, right? They were making things up. They just say, well, it's, uh, that's the local arrangement. And they were encouraged to do so. Get unions out of the way and let bosses and employers work out something that was pretty flexible. That was a very important ingredient. And if you mix the two together, a lack of compliance, on the, sorry, a lack of ability of organised labour on the one hand, um, through the legislative and other changes, Combine that with the situation that the students found themselves in. And another important part here for both university and TAFE students was the increased financial, financial pressure on many of these people and the increasing rates and costs of education. The fees that started creeping through the TAFE and other end meant that they were under more pressure than, than ever before. There was another component to this too and that is in places and in regional areas that are more highly unionised, we believe that there was a real effort on the part of many to steer away from the locals. They would sooner go for the um, students, who many of whom came into town, 
because as we, as we described in some detail what happened when uh, a certain father found out what was going on in one of the shops down in town, decided to take matters into his own hands and, well, that was the end of wage theft. It was also the end of the job, unfortunately, and a few other things. But what you start to see in those cases is the rest of the character of wage theft. It's not just about the money. It is about power and it is about control. And an important thing, as you've seen there, and the, the numbers that Ashley actually put together pull it out, that it's gendered as well. It's largely, if you had a face to, to, uh, uh, to wage theft in the Illawarra, and I have no reason to suspect it's any different elsewhere, you're looking at a 19, 20-year-old female student. That's what you're looking at. Now, can you imagine what happens when it's tight for jobs, and that exploitation is happening and bosses basically believe that if you're free to do what they like. Well, you get some bosses asking for favours for jobs, which is another really, really nasty part of this. And Ashley had two to three first-hand accounts of that. Unfortunately, they weren't reported and there were many factors relating to that, but I think one may be ongoing. But that's okay, we know who they are. The second thing is or the, the other aspect of that too is that they know that the consequences of being uh, exposed for wage theft back then were nothing. The government would give the slap on the wrist if you were lucky. If you were lucky, you'd get some of the money back. If you were lucky. And if not, you'd probably not get many other job opportunities and waste a lot of time and effort. Things started to change when you get people like Ashley and this story on mass becoming a national story, along with the Caltechs and the various other, other ones that came through. But there's a history to this, and this is the important part, that this didn't happen out of nowhere. And the factors, and I'll go through some of these without going in detail, but I think particularly in this audience, you're probably well versed in them. The cash in hand aspect, which is a historical feature, it's not new. But in the context of what I just described and the changes, it comes into focus because it becomes very attractive, particularly in the post-GST and post other sort of light tax years. So the cash in hand economy, the various excuses that are given and the various forms that it takes from incorrect rates classifications and penalties, absence of records, the extra hours and personal vehicles, resources, not accounted for or reimbursed, the misuse and outright corruption of the training system, apprenticeships and traineeships. That is a whole other aspect which feeds in to that. And you can't have that, of course, without the other trend that was happening at the same time, which was the privatisation of Fed. So you had the Mickey Mouse private training providers that would fit hand in glove with the whole wage theft business model. It became enmeshed. It became yet another opportunity, yet another way in which employers could directly get some subsidies for the training sort of component of the process and an excuse to have a trainee for six years without getting one bit of paper in. Or, in the worst case scenarios, actually um, uh, uh, employers milking both ends and saying that they would be doing the training and getting the accreditation and not performing it. In fact, we had one incredible incident, which was national news the first time around in 2006, I think it was. Greg Combe comes down to Wollongong and we told him a story that he couldn't believe. It was a place called Chili's Restaurant. And the young workers there were actually required to bring their own float of $100. And if any of the customers did a runner, they had to pay out of their own money for any customer that did the runner. They had to reconcile their own floats, right? And of course, they were trainees too. They weren't even getting paid the full rate. They were somehow trainees. The ultimate irony is the next big case that we have in terms of fraud, and that's what it is, was with the Outback Restaurant. On exactly the same site. It's the same restaurant. And ironically, both Chili's and Outback are part of a US-type southern chain. 
Remarkable coincidences, right? It's just one of these remarkable coincidences. And Outback, of course, struck gold. We've heard about these zombie industrial agreements. They're terrific, these things. I mean, you land that, you land, you land gold. You negotiated them in 1999, sorry, 2000, 2001. And unless they're overturned, they continue forever. And they're allowed to actually pay beneath the boot, beneath the better road. So they can actually underpay legally because they, those, those things haven't been rolled. And of course, in that, they also throw in the training component and give a chop out to their mates who provide some training to the staff, which continues till to die. Now, just on that point, an interesting aside to all of this is that even though uh, our ability to enter the premises and inspect books these days may be limited. The idea of the consumer boycott and reputational damage is very strong. It's no accident then that they say because of what the Greenies are doing with the coal mines, that was their excuse, they actually want to start moving against consumer boycotts as well to make them illegal. But somehow in a capitalist society where the, you have a market and people can have a right to choose, you yeah, have a right to the freedom of choice and the market mechanism, well, not anymore, apparently. You can't sway others for these sorts of purposes. That is on, the, uh, on their agenda. A lot of that has to do with the fact that these tactics have actually been uh, quite successful. So, if we look at some of these... Uh, uh, can, oh, sorry, before I, before I proceed with the others, there is one thing I did want to mention in terms of wage theft and the types, the garden variety versus others. People assume that this is a private sector sport. Not so. Not so. We've seen it now amongst teachers, amongst many other public sector workers, that it happens in the public sector too. In fact, one of the most interesting things I, I understand in a TAFE was it up in the Hunter someone who was being asked to, uh, well, let me get this correct because I don't want to, I don't want to uh, get the facts wrong of the matter, but let's just say that there was an issue in relation to hours worked and hours paid and the paperwork submitted, which was found to be corrupt behaviour. But see, the rider to all of this was that it was at the lower end of corruption. So wage theft is at the lower end of corruption. Now that, that's instructive, that tells a story. That tells a story. So wage theft, I mean if that was, if that was corruption and ripping off the state of New South Wales or the TAFE process or whatever, you'd be in jail by now, right? But they'd be pushing for a, for a custodial sentence. But because it's theft against the worker, it's the lower end, the lower end of the scale. I thought I'd throw that in because it's only just come down the last sort of few weeks and it is very, very instructive in terms of that attitude even within the public sector who we know are coming under a lot of pressure to behave like the private sector and their business models. Okay, so if we, if we turn to the worst cases it's hard to go past international students and visa workers. And we've seen basically where exactly they are in the peck or pecking order with the, uh, with the uh, job seeker and job keeper reforms. Imagine to leave out the most vulnerable workers at all who've got bugger all chance of going anywhere, they're stuck, and to deny them, to deny them the ability to actually you know, get that sort of assistance from a humanitarian perspective, if nothing else. What do you think that does to the drivers of wage theft and exploitation? You have got tens of thousands, probably many more, workers with no income, right? No income. And for those that are studying, many of them can't even resume their actual studies as well, at least not to the level for many that they had previously come to do it. They're stuck with nowhere to go. You've got to pull right there and there. So let me throw this in at the moment. Have you noticed that through this COVID crisis, the fruit pickers have put in a special plea 
to bring in overseas workers to pick their fruit here in Australia. A very strange request why you would compromise your borders at this time to bring in fruit pickers when there's double digit unemployment. Why would you do that? Right? No one has suggested the obvious is that if they really think, well, no one really wants it, and, or even if, you, even if they wanted to go the route of the locals are lazy and they'll never come down and pick fruit. There are tens of thousands of international students and visa workers with no income who I bet would jump at the opportunity to come down. So here's a thought, and it's something that we've put on the table. I had a bit of a chat to the ACTU about it last week. I'm happy to go down for a drive with them and meet some of those fruit-picking corporations and go through their books and just sort of say, well, all we want to be satisfied is you're not ripping them off, that the reason you don't want to bring them in from overseas is to underpay them. I couldn't imagine anyone doing that. Right? Just to make sure that they pay award wages. And I reckon we can get... We can get buses full, socially distanced of course, to come down and actually do some of that work and get some of that money during the fruit picking season. No one has suggested this. Isn't it bizarre? All of these things, and by the way, I'm, I'm not saying that every, uh, every outfit and every industry sort of like this in every firm, but the truth be said, and I'm putting in a big plug here for the United Workers Union, They've done a lot of work, as have the AWU, exposing a lot of that exploitation and the conditions in which they've been forced to live, many of these fruit pickers and others within those areas. So I think that if we were to look at the conditions around wage theft and the COVID sort of situation, it doesn't take Einstein to work out that those pressures are multiplied in this, in this, uh, in this environment. So, let's... Um, Let's let's look at some of the let's look at some of the specifics. Pete, do you reckon we could? Uh, why don't we go for Brian? Actually, number three or number four on your list, maybe as you're going through that. Some interesting dynamics around this. When uh, well, I'll speak to anyone while you're, you're getting it through. Ashley had collected so much data that we thought we won't let that go to waste. So we. Uh, we pulled it together and I did a bit of rough, rough numbers work with it and discovered a couple of very interesting things about the way in which both the cash economy and uh, the general uh, negotiation process worked. You had a whole range of the 80 or so businesses that we'd had on the list by the end of it almost 70 to 80 percent were cash in hand, right? Or at least part cash in hand. And the going rates weren't even an attempt to marry up with the award. And if you could picture a graph and two spikes on frequency. In other words, if you had 80 cases, you'll have 30 here and another 30 or 40 here. One was at $10 an hour, and the other was at $50 an hour. Very odd. You'd think you'd, you know, they might be spaced between $10 and $20, from the lowest to the highest. And it became pretty clear when I spoke and interviewed Ashley a bit more in depth and some of the other uh, student workers, what was going on. Now, this is the interesting thing. The, the $10 an hour was the boss's rate. Right? They'd sort of worked out 10 bucks. Do you know what's interesting about that? They all said it. Funny that, isn't it? They didn't all say 11, they didn't say 12, they didn't say 13. They didn't say 16. They were for like three days, starting at 5, closing at 10. And um, it was a promised rate of $16 an hour, but at the end of the third day, they offered me only 12, which I said I would consider it. And then when I did, I went back there and they only took me for a day and then they told me that they have other people coming for trial. So um, I'll have to wait and I didn't want to put it back there. I definitely felt like they took advantage of me because I was helpless and I was ready to take whatever they offered me and I actually did. Okay, um, I'll come back to that. Maybe another one, Pete, and I'll, uh, I'll wrap the trials in with the K 
case of the motor vehicle accident and the $10,000 personal claim. was paid at a part-time casual rate, which was quite low, it was $11.80 when I was 19, um, and I was pulling in about $150 a week. We weren't respected as staff, we were sort of treated as, um, if you don't like working here, you don't get paid enough, it doesn't matter, we can just hire 20 more people, there's always people that need jobs in Wollongong, and there are lots of people, unfortunately, that are happy to take jobs that are very low pay. The final straw was um, my wisdom teeth got infected and I needed them removed and um, they kept giving me tonsillitis and so I was on all this medication and I had to take painkillers and it hurt to move my jaw and they didn't believe me when I said that I was too sick to come into work. I couldn't talk, I couldn't you know, sort of stand around and carry meals out and talk to people um, and so when they said that they didn't really believe me, I sort of thought this is enough, I deserve more respect than this, I deserve to have time off. And I just had to quit. Can't do it. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll stick to that. That was Kiara. That was the chain at the Outback restaurant. So, um, so I'll just finish the story in terms of the negotiation. The chains and stuff would have their own rates, which they'd make up at like eleven dollars and eighty and others. But in terms of the vast majority of the others, there was seventy eighty percent that were stuck ten dollars and fifteen. Ten dollars was the boss's rate. The fact that you had uh, 40, 50 uh, places that would say $10 indicates very clearly that there's collusion going on there between the bosses. That doesn't happen by accident. They know, and the, and the kids or the young workers, I should say, also know that $10 is what the boss is prepared to pay cash in hand. That wasn't totally surprising, but it was the smoking gun. The surprising bit was the $15 an hour. And as Kiara explained, that was the premium cash rate. And that's what the students negotiated. Because when they push the boss, the boss would say, well, I, if I have to pay tax and whatever, and they'd say, okay, well, if $18, $19, and they worked out, that they wouldn't do it for less than 15. This isn't great, right? This is still cash in hand. But they worked out that they could kick for 15, and the boss was still ahead, and oh well, you know, if they've got to take the job, they've got to take the job. As I described in my paper, or did at the time, that was a form of early form of organising and negotiation and bargaining on the part of the students. So what you started to see there was they were talking amongst themselves too. There was an awareness of their exploitation, and the bosses obviously was a thought that was clearly organised. So you don't only have a business model you have the entrenchment and you have the development and the collusion to build essentially a black market model. I mean, that's, that's essentially what, what's been happening here, which is the worst part and why my earlier comments about the role of the state here, the role of the, the, uh, the system in supporting that and driving employers to do their own deals, that's how it happens and that's the result. That's what happens. That is the, that is the outcome of all of these years of that neoliberal push to deregulate, to decentralise, to do your own thing and to cut out unions and any form of uh, transparency, really, because all of this is hidden. It's the very antithesis, really, of, of disclosure of transparency and those other things. I'll just move this along quite quickly because I know that I'm sort of running out of time. The, okay, so... In broader terms, what I'm suggesting here is that wage thefts, like other aspects that we've discussed here and that you know, we, we can see in terms of uh, slow wage growth and deterioration conditions and other things, they can't be viewed in isolation. The neoliberal view is that it's a bad apple story. Our view is that it's a bad orchard as well. This is not the bad apple. This is systemic. And what I've tried to do is explain how some of these factors coalesce, basically, work together to support a business model in wage theft. 
in a similar way to how they work together in a, you know, in a very uh, 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 corrosive way of the other sort of principles, I guess, of, uh, of good governance amongst other things. And not only ripping off the worker, but ripping, ripping off the taxpayer, the state, health and safety. Let me give you one quick example on health and safety. The most recent example I had, and by the way, 70 to 80% of the calls that I get from South Coast Labor Council are wage debt. 70 to 80% of the calls are wage debt. That's from the, from the public. Okay, just to give you an indication. The last one that I had was particularly nasty. And that was a kid who was, I'd say a kid, because he was 17 when he started, he was just turning 18, working at the fish markets down south. Started work for a couple of weeks, that's as far as he got, basically. Had an accident delivering fish on his red feet once, must have been, up in the Southern Highlands, going around the roundabout, just an accident, wasn't a particularly major one either. The employer decided that he wasn't going to foot the bill. He was quite clearly didn't have the kid on the books, did he? Didn't have the kid on the books, he had the feet plates and what have you. That was two and a half years ago. By the time he hit my, my desk, the parents who were just going out of their brains, their dad was a good MUA member and the mum was a principal at a high school, so they, uh, they gave us a bell and said, well, this is ridiculous. We've just received a letter from the insurance company asking our son to personally pay $10,000 because the insurance company has decided they're not going to go after the owner of the vehicle. They will go after the driver. $10,000 for someone who was employed illegally at the Got time. Into a training position, which the business owner had paid me job dog. And and for that, and for that, we had to go through, I think I got as far as three phone calls. We, I spoke to the lawyers, I spoke to the lawyer's supervisors, and then I had to speak to a partner. I won't tell you the exact nature of the conversation, it wasn't pretty, but I indicated more or less that reputational damage works pretty strongly against the legal firms as well on this sort of stuff because were they aware that they perhaps were exposed themselves and complicit in that I am letting them know and I have done in writing that that was the, the young worker was illegally employed and I'm advising them of this and if they wanted to proceed with this I'll rely on all of that and we'll get our own lawyers involved. I had an apology from the partner who also spoke to the parents and they discontinued the case. How many of those are going underneath the carpet? How many of those? Now that's the extent to which some of this stuff goes. By the way, the kid wasn't even paid. Just a little bit. Right? After all of it. I mean, that is an ordeal. For a, I mean, it should never have been given a company vehicle on red peas, no training as to the vehicle or anything else. I mean, they were gone. I mean, I was kind of looking forward to a, to a court case on that one. That would have been, but at the end of the day, they they uh, they dropped it there and there. So that gives you an indication of the other tentacles in which this moves. And we won't get onto eye care and the workers' compensation. <laughs> that would have lost the money. What I wanted to leave you with, and um, I'm anticipating questions around some of those broader issues, and also looking around the room and understanding of some of the the underpinning sort of issues as well. But in the current context, um, I think it's instructive in the sense that there are discussions, as we know, around a whole range of issues about what happens next after the COVID crisis. If the COVID crisis has taught us one thing, and in this we have the backing of health professionals amongst many others, it's that casualised, insecure work, and cutting corners and deregulation. All of these things have actually worked against us collectively. We're told we're all in this together. Well, 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 well we're, we're all in this together. Well, we can all have a good look at the situation and say, what's it going to take? And I think, the, I think the, 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 the jury's come back with that one, that you can't continue for a whole lot of reasons, not least of which our health 
we can't continue with these arrangements in our employment, something that basic, which uh, often, whether it be the cash in hand or whether it be the casualised and other things, let alone the things that we've just discussed. I guess the point I'm making here is that the crisis in wage theft, amongst many other things, predated obviously COVID. And if our systemic responses were not up to the task of dealing with that then, how can they possibly do that now with the pressures that are building? And I'd go a step further and say the other clear thing that we know now from the COVID crisis is that the market has been shown itself to be totally impotent and incapable of dealing with these crises. It is the state, it is the taxpayer that has dragged us out of this, not the market. The market, as I told the media the other day, is on strike. Capital is currently on strike. They're hanging back. Why? Because they want certainty. They're not going to invest unless there's certainty. I don't know, when I studied economics, the idea was the profit comes because you're taking a risk. These bastards don't want to take a risk. They want to use the taxpayer's money which they're doing quite well on the stock market, I'm told at the moment. Alan Cole, I'm told, so it's, it, it's, it's going up. They don't want to risk their money. They want to blow ours. Again, after the GFC, where two trillion, or something like that, I think was some of the estimates internationally, that cost the workers of the world to actually pay back. After that experience, they're at it again with COVID. What we need to be very sure about, I think, in terms of our responses, is that this time around, we need to make sure before the rules change, before the pressure comes on and the deals are done, that we make it very, very clear to everybody that it is not the market and it is not the private sector that has fixed a lot of these problems, that, it's, that it is the taxpayer, it is regulation, it is intervention by the state that is addressing this crisis. The market is incapable of doing it. It is if it's demonstrated that. And if it is incapable of dealing with that, how on earth can we go back to relying on the market again to take care of these kids, these young workers, and the generations to come? Because if you listen carefully to where the government's pivoting on this, they're already talking about giving business a break. Forget about the workers and, the t and everybody giving business a break is where they're at. If their answer is going to be more cutting of corners, more deregulation, more turning off the spotlights, more tax cuts for that top end, then the incidences of wage theft can only go one way. Can only go one way. Our hope is that the narrative of the Call it, we're all in this together, or, you know, in broader terms, that's all collectivist, I'll, I'll, I'm happy with that. As long as people understand that whilst we're all in it together, some of us are paying more than others with it as a proportion, and it's the, and it's the workers and the taxpayers more broadly that are actually bailing out, again, right? And one central tenet, if I can leave you with this, and it pertains to those most vulnerable, and particularly a lot of those workers and others, the notion that survival of the fittest, the notion that somehow the strongest and the best and the others don't hold them back, let them lead the way, and that they deserve everything they get because they work harder and better. The whole notion of the survival of the fittest has taken a bit of a tumble. We've gone from survival of the fittest through to the real saviour, which is the protection of the most vulnerable. And that is the most incredible thing that's happened through this COVID crisis. And I think it's also instructive that we have all realised that we are as strong as our weakest link. And what saves us as a whole is not letting the racehorses go up the front who can exploit and cheat and do whatever they do and go for gold and amass their billions. They're not going to save us. What's going to save us is taking care of the most vulnerable. And in terms of the most vulnerable, if you're looking at those students, if you're looking at the international workers and the visa workers and the others, they are the most vulnerable. And yet, at that level, the government is doing its two-tier trick. They don't vote, 
or they don't vote for me anyway, I think he's sort of pretty, pretty sort of safe to assume, then they're not interested. And I think that is, they're the sorts of pieces in the puzzle that we have to put into the picture, because the government won't, and many of the commentators won't. We need to make sure that things like wage theft, the, the uh, low rate of wage increases and other things, are not left behind when that when we put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And that we ensure that, it, that we keep looking after the most vulnerable. And we don't let them to sort of say, OK, we can switch to big bastards again and, uh, and uh, cutting job, job seeker, punishing the unemployed, cutting corners for, the, for, for business and everyone else, and imposing regulations on those that, that, uh, uh, that we don't like. So I've gone around the world a couple of times with this, but I am anticipating that some of the stories you've already heard, I'll try to sort of look at it in terms of the context of COVID. So thanks for listening, and uh, I hope it adds something to it. Thank you very much, Alfred. Okay, so mm -hmm. you want to... Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll go straight into the question and answer. Uh, there's only the one microphone. So, um, uh, the, the rules are you've got three minutes maximum. If you start with a comment, please finish with a question. Um, and, you know, we've got a, a small group here, and there's a lot of experience in the room, and, and Arthur's been very frank about the situation, so I think we could have a good, good uh, exchange now in the Q&A. So, who wants to go first? Thank you for your help, I'm Joffrey. And uh, my question has to do with uh, the framework of a wage, in, especially in neoliberal capitalist frameworks. People look at uh, wages as advances by capital and uh, the right of the employer to be able to recover it. And uh, related to that is an observation that Sometimes there are two victims, the worker and the petty capitalist cafe operator, whom I've known a number are, work, are living in their cars because of bankruptcy. And it brings me to think that perhaps we have to restore the primordial, primordial right to work for oneself on one's terms until they can find, unless there is someone willing to pay them to work for them instead and make it more rewarding. So how do you feel about the policy of yeah, universal basic income or something similar to that that would correct uh, the relational asymmetry between employer and employee. Because uh, once that happens, capital will actually be more efficient because it will go to enterprises that does not take advantage of the desperation of the worker to find a job because the workforce is free to work for themselves first. Yeah, well, that's that's a good point. Um, okay, so let me let me set up my views on UPI uh, clearly here. I understand where the concept comes from, the drivers behind it. My concern about universal basic um, income approaches that I the way that I understand it is that they have a tendency, in my view to alienate labour and alienate them in a way that um, may be detrimental to the worker themselves. The, assum the assumption that by giving a, a guaranteed income to all, uh, all people, to all working people, and the assumption that they will be able to actually work is a big leap, I think. 
And what it does do, in my view, is that it could undermine the ability or the willingness or the efforts of workers to actually bargain for a greater share and a fairer share of the fruits of, uh, of, uh, of their labouring industry and elsewhere. It may act as a discount, for example. Let me put, let me, let me put it in, in, uh, in practical terms. I get a basic income of uh, $1,000 a week from the government. I'm free to go and sell my labour and work, work elsewhere. Let's assume I want to work in a bank or I work in a factory. When we have a negotiation about wages, the employer will say, no, I don't think we should be giving you $2,000 a week. You're getting 1000 for the government. I think we might have to peg it back to about 1200 and you still would be about $200 more than where you were before. I mean, these are very, you know, very general sort of terms. The point I'm trying to make is that it severs that link and the claim that we as workers, all being in the capitalist system, have were a fruit of our labour, which is a right within the engines of capital. You're dealing with labour in isolation, rather the ownership of the means of production. And, the, and, the, and let's face it, the big drivers, the resource companies, the factories, the finance sector, they're still there. It doesn't change them. It doesn't change those structures. All it does is it treats the worker more as a consumer, in my view, than as a worker. It gives you money to spend at these places and to use the money that other taxpayers would pay, right, to actually be a consumer within that capitalist system rather than demanding a fairer share, in my view, from those that actually own the means of production. That would be, in general terms, that is my main concern about the UBI. Having said that, I think what we need to explore at this point is looking at it from another angle. I actually don't, I don't have a problem, to be honest with you, with subsidising employers for part of that wage. I actually think the principle is right. I would have preferred the money going straight to the worker, I guess. But from another end, what it does do is it allows us to actually work with the whole training system and others, the apprentices, trainees and what have you. I think it's a good principle. We need to come back, I think, to this view that skill formation, for example, the lifelong process and other things, does need to have state involvement, not just the state delivering the training, but actually a needs to be funded and resourced. And sure, it needs to be paid for by taxes, and those corporations should be paying their tax. I would prefer to look more at intervening in that process there where the work happens, rather than delivering it to the worker more as a, a, an amount of living expenses and reducing the worker, in my view, as a consumer, rather than in their, what I would consider to be their role in that production process. Does that make sense? That would be, to me, that would be my, my greatest concern. Is there any space of automation? Uh, I can, there's, automation is another question. I've got another view on that. <laughs> I'm Caroline Turner. Um, yeah, I think what you're saying is quite good because after all, we're going to give politicians a basic living rate and mightn't it be a little bit more linear than ours as everything else? Um, I think politicians didn't... Um, Well, they didn't go, they weren't sitting in Parliament a lot of the time and they took no time off unpaid. They still copped all their wages and their, they still got their average $50,000 a year rise, um, which they get all of them, that's the average one. Um, and I think with also that money comes from it will depend on how rich a country is because our, our country, people invest 
in things that are really involved in ripping off other countries. Um, and so giving everybody in a country good social um, standard of living and a welfare and all this costs money if the society's sort of got it. And I think it's much better to um, look at... Uh, and, but that's if, and everyone would have to pay their taxes. So I just think... Um, I think taxes should be um, paid much more equally uh, instead of like what we're doing now. I mean, we're using our taxes to use to um, improve our public transport before it's flogged off to overseas companies. Um, and then we'll see a, probably a big decline and much more, you know, um, Fairs and everything, um, and I think a lot of the, I don't know that we're learning much about from from um, the um, COVID thing because the nursing homes Morrison stopped like the banks investigation into them. Um, I know my mother was in a nursing home that was run by Macquarie Bank. They had a whole string of them. They got you coming, they got you going. Um, so, um, if you invested in health, it sounds like, oh, really a nice thing. You'd be investing in Macquarie nursing homes. And um, I just think we're just getting less and less. Um, the, go the government seems unable to uh, regulate things. Uh, they're giving the big end of town um, open slather, and I think we're actually going right downhill. And I think it'll be a big scramble to get back where they were. That's just my opinion. I, I take that as a comment, and yeah, I, I think that that sounds about right to me. Look, with the politicians. Um, Clearly, if you're looking at setting the example, they're on a pretty healthy superannuation rate as well, and, note, and they're trying to cut everyone else's, uh, sorry, not, uh, not increase the next round, that's the, that's the word on the street. So I think there is some value in um, comparing what they get versus others. But look, I think um, ultimately the COVID experience is very, very clear. These things have left indelible marks in people's minds and they will do so for years. And if there is one thing, one thing in those nursing homes, it is casual, insecure work, unregulated. The feds have stuffed this up totally and that's becoming clearer. And the question on everyone's minds is, should it be taken over by the state government? Should we have, should we have uh, for-profit homes um, should they get federal sort of money? I mean, you always have places where the rich want to go, great. But everyone else, I think, will demand, will be demanding, well, if we're going to have these homes, we want run uh, for the common good, for the public good, for those people themselves, and we want actual regulation and a plan, not a Mickey Mouse plan. So I, I think these things are clear. I think that's... The question is, is basically, um, well, I think Labor's got a role to play here. Are they demanding that? Are they demanding the takeover of those, of those homes? And I think that'll be the big question. I know the HSU has already called for an increase in the Medicare levy to start funding more places. I think we can do more than that than just increasing the levy. I think we, there are systemic issues now about, about, uh, about the aged care industry. So. Uh, yeah, there was a thing. Could I just add another little comment? It was bad when it was bad when he was premier, uh, who said there doesn't have to be a um, registered nurse in any nursing home. Mm. Uh, and people talk about nurses in nursing home. Usually, there really aren't any. Um, they're carers. They're poorly trained. People, lot often from other countries, 
and they will, um, they're the ones who do most of the work, yeah, um, and um, I just think that, all, you know, and plus they should be regulated because, um, yeah. Thank you, Kendrick. Yes, Arthur, I agree with you about the role of the state, but I, I think the key lesson from your experience is it was actually organising, like the students starting to organise it and held by the unions that resulted in change. And I just wondered if you could tell us, having named and shamed all these um, various businesses in Wollongong, do you think that you now... I mean, it's difficult now because of the COVID crisis, but did that establish that sort of effort at organising the workers and students and the unions coming in as an organised force, did that actually create a new standard or um, mean that more of those businesses had to actually pay the award rate? I mean, what, what was the outcome there? Okay, so... Two parts to that. Of the 12 young people there who featured, we got 10 out of the 12, basically, their entitlements back, all of them. 10 out of the 12. That's the South Coast Labor Council with one full time officer. The federal government, through the Fair Work Ombudsman, they got 10% back of what we did. And they have the entire apparatus of the federal government. Has that changed? No, it hasn't. There is an awareness though now, a greater awareness that if, and that is because there have been subsequent uh, cases. I should add, the biggest case we've ever had, and I think it might be the biggest case in New South Wales history for two people, is $500,000 for two overseas workers, $250,000 each. And that was the case of an Indian restaurant where massive exploitation that case is, is still sort of continuing. And that was headline news on the ABC and everywhere else. So each time that we do that, it's a refresher course for other employers. But it is only as effective as tomorrow's paper. And the news cycle that's just, particularly at the moment, gone a bit crazy. So you're right, the organising is, is, is important. We're doing it under Union Town, as that's what we do in a Union Town. We stick together and we get the information through. The parents are probably more organised than their, than their children. They know who to you know, read. Convincing their young ones to actually join the union, whatever else they do. Normally that happens when they when they get a machine. So, but then again, I mean, they're not alone then. Two, one important thing that has changed, the United Workers Union amalgamation and uh, the adoption of I think some very innovative place-based strategies. Um, not quite like the US local system, but it's an interesting hybrid of the industry structure versus the locality structure, which works really well for the union town for us, because we can play straight with that. What I would do, I would put an organiser on campus. I reckon they would pay their wages many times over. Right? That would be one easy way, and I'm in discussions constantly with the union. They like my enthusiasm about it, they're not quite there yet, they're still working out their models. But what would fix it? That would fix it, because the students come and go. Well, if the students come and go, you don't put your office in the city, you put your office where the students are, where they can comfortably come up and discuss with you and with each other what's going on. To me, it's an obvious strategy. Have the union office on campus. If that is where the workers are, that's where you're based at. That would really re revolutionise organising for that particular sector. So, yes and no. There has been some effects, but as things stand, with the laws as they stand, we probably run a greater chance of eliminating COVID than wage theft. <laughs> okay. Anyone else have a question? Hi, uh, John. <laughs> I... You mentioned having studied economics and um, 
I just want to ask a question, basically, or lead up to a question um, about the Labour Party, uh, the party of, um, of workers, workers' representatives, um, and the current environment that we've arrived in, which you, which you described here, and the lead up to it. In the 19th century, when uh, we didn't have the same industrial relations system as, as we did in the 20th, the argument, the principal argument of economics, which, which was essentially a formulation of how do we get all the things around you from the, you know, the tables and chairs we have here to electricity to everything, and was based on the profit, system, the profit motive. And within that, uh, as probably Frank Storm knows more than I do, <laughs> and he studied economics, the essential principle in, in relation to labour was what was called the marginal productivity of labour theory. And in, in very simple terms, labour was rewarded according to its contribution to the maximum profit of the firm. Marginal simply means to the utmost limit. And people were rewarded in terms of their contribution as to how much profit the company made, or the most it can make. And in very simple terms, as, as a friend of mine who's been an economist for 30 years said, well, actually it means the cleaner gets the lowest amount and the engineer gets the most because the contributions they make are different. Now in 1907 in Australia, with the harvester decision, you, um, the principle was set up momentarily that people got paid to how much in, in accordance to how much they could live on. That was a, a husband and a wife and three children. It, simply because people were saying, well, we're getting paid the marginal product of our labour, but we simply cannot live on it. We can't live on it. And all through the period of Andrew Fisher, um, James Scullin, uh, John Curtin, and Ben Chifley, the arbitration system was kept with the aim of maintaining a wage you could live on. Now, in the Hall Keating area, that was effectively wound backwards because both Hawke and Keating said, well, we've got to return to the principles of economics, and if you do that, you have to start returning to paying people according to the marginal product of labour. And that is in terms of, you know, whether you're a cleaner or an engineer, not in terms of how much you can live on. And I think one of the most fundamental planks that was just pulled out of the mood was keeping an enterprise bargain. Because once you got to the stage of saying, well, you can't have um, across the board wage decisions anymore, or effectively the decisions of the arbitration commissions or arbitration courts setting an industry-wide livable wage. You simply negotiate in the factory that you're having to be in. To me, it started saying on a general level, well, you can basically pay people whatever you want. Post-1993, post, post pay them whatever you want because it's enterprise bargaining and basically it's survival of the fittest and you just try and get what you can or accept what's given to you. And, and surely that's how, I'm just, my question is, isn't that how, that how things developed and how we got to this point, this environment we live in? I guess it's also a way of saying, well, how the hell can we get back from here, having come to where we are now? I'll try and do this in two minutes. <laughs> so, two points in relation to that. The first is that one of the things that COVID has done has challenge that narrative. The whole notion of value and the value of work. I'm glad you mentioned the clean. Because if we are to look now at, forget what the economists say, what the government thinks that we contribute, right? forget the, the established notions or the pre-COVID notions. I ask you this, if you were to ask anyone on the street the value of a nurse and the value of a COVID era cleaner, how valuable they are to the economy and the economic recovery of this country right now. Put a figure on it and double it, triple it, quadruple it, pay 10 times the amount of wage. If you could convince people that we had these super efficient cleaners, they're working their guts out and they're making sure that we don't slip into a Victoria style situation here in New South Wales, what they would be prepared to pay. Heck, ask the bosses themselves, ask the capitalists what they would be prepared to pay to avoid us slipping into that. 
and they'll just say quietly, don't make a song and dance about it and fix the bloody thing. Pay them what you need to and do the job. Everyone knows now that the preconceived views of what Labor is worth have gone out the window, at least during the COVID period. I'm not saying it's going to stay this afterwards. But we would be really negligent to not use this opportunity in the union movement to shape and reshape that narrative of value, the value of labour. Right? This is a unique opportunity we have. And I'm pleased to see the ACT is doing that. If you look at their closely at their messaging, that is precisely what they're doing. This is a narrative attack, full frontal. Who dragged us out of this crisis? The workers. That's why I said at the very start, the obvious thing is the market has disappeared. They're invisible, they're impotent. They're sitting back. We're spoon feeding the bosses, if not wiping their asses as well, quite frankly, at the moment. We're doing everything. They're sitting back, waiting for the taxpayer, the state, the public sector, to fix the problem. This is a story that must be left indelibly in people's minds. Because we're going to come back to this. This is going to be the real fight after COVID. This is what it's all going to be about. The second point, just briefly. Let's look at that model of adding to that marginal value. And I ask you this. The coal miners who are currently on casual contract on $30 and $40 an hour for multinationals. Do we seriously believe that their marginal contribution to those profits of those multinationals is $30 $40 an hour? You're looking at a small workforce for a multi-million dollar profit. Clearly, that's not the case. What has happened here is the intervention of the state on the part of those multinationals to ensure that their true value is not realised through their bargaining process. question follows on from Pax and John said. Um, I don't know how many people watch Q&A or watch the Q&A on Monday, but anyway, leave it aside. I just watched a little bit of it. But what is the, the, the ruling class tactic is divide and rule. And the latest thing they're pushing is the divide between the young ones and the baby boomers and the old ones. The old ones have got at all easy and the young ones are struggling, which is, you know, in some respects true. But the thing that struck me about the discussion a little bit that I heard on Monday night is the critical point where you're in the front line is how can we revive the Australian trade union movement? That's, that's it in a nutshell. If we're going to overcome wage theft, if we're going to overcome all the other problems of the trade in movement, we must. There's no possibility we can do it with 10, 15% coverage. So I suppose my question is, out of this, the fantastic work, which I missed the first part, but here that the South Coast Labor Council has done and other unions are doing, I just feel like, wow, we need to have some big thinking. Uh, it's starting to develop an ACT, but we've got to have some innovative thinking of the trade union, how are we going to recruit the young people, the gig economy people? We've got to have new ways of recruiting them. And I just wonder, for example, did most of the people that um, were involved in the campaign actually join the union, as distinct from getting their wages back from the union? Uh, you know, a, a former delegate myself, you know, I don't think you can do anything much if you haven't got 50% coverage in a workplace, you know. Um, we've got to be, I don't know, I'm thinking back, sorry, I'll finish shortly. I'm thinking back to 1976 and the campaign against the destruction of Medimac, when we had a national conference, a national ACTU-sponsored conference, which was not just, you know, the official delegates of the ACTU, which was huge. Um, I just think coming out of COVID, we've got to start thinking big about some massive campaign for the reconstruction of the trade union movement and get us up above that 20%, up to 30%, 40%, 50%.
If we don't do that, I don't think, I mean, wage that will just continue. We can win things, but unless the workers themselves are organising their workplaces and, and, will, and, and do that, um, we, we will not crack this problem. Anyway, that's, yeah, I just think, could you comment on that, please? Look, I totally agree. <laughs> we need the question is out. The question is out. And I guess what I've been leading into is that the way in which the union movement has approached this crisis, and well, for our part, we've been going since, since December. We went through the, the whole bushfires that racked through the, the South Coast. We haven't stopped. We've been trying to reconstruct the South Coast when we got hit with COVID. And what we did then was form the big unity tickets with the small businesses. They told us, we've got three months. If the federal government does not get off its ass and help us, we have three months. What we did then, I see Rob and our friends from the Teachers Fed and others is trying to rebuild TAFE. They said, well, look, you can't create jobs overnight. At the very least, make TAFE free for every student on the South Coast affected by the bushfires. And we're almost there. And we got their agreement to actually start getting free courses basically sort of, you know, across the end and face to face and doing those things. That came from the union. And people down there know where it comes from. They now ring us. They now ring us. But that not, isn't necessarily going to get membership up. What will get membership up is when we have that discussion post-COVID about permanency, job security, which will enable the union movement to actually sign people up. We have gone through the strategies, more, more strategies than you can think of about casual workers and others, but ultimately a casual worker is still a casual worker. And they will work one or two or three or four different jobs. And one worker may be working in three different workplaces and they're not going to join three unions. We'll like and get them in for one. We still don't have a system in place where we can actually deal and organise around that, that we can have maybe one union covering some of these workers. There are structural issues the union movement has to address, no doubt. But I've got no doubt that the current strategy, which is the narrative, the big discussion, and I, I've copped a bit of criticism for comparing this to a war. My defence is, is this. It is something that people understand. It is something that enables people to sort of say, you're not a bloody communist by suggesting the government should move in and take over, essentially, what you would get before. People's mindsets are, throw the army, throw the public, throw whatever you can at this, and we're going to work as human beings, not as relations to capital, right? This is what it entitles you to do. For me, I had another reason to do it, because we've already been through the bushfires now, and people are shell-shocked. What we wanted to do is to say that wars come to an end, and then you've got to build the peace. And we wanted to do the throwback to the post-war period and the generations that built this country, how they did it, and more importantly, I think, the capacity to be able to learn from history. That is where I thought the war analogy was valid. I copped it, though, I've got to tell you, but being a peace movement person myself, but I, I still think that that is cutting through. People, once you say that, they go, OK, we've got to do what it takes to actually fix this. I'd like to say a few things, just picking up on what you just said, Arthur, because I think that war analogy, uncomfortable as it is, is probably very appropriate in the current circumstances. We're talking about a collectivist response public interest, uh, but in the immediate term for the class interest, which is of course what you focused on by your analysis of the, uh, of the wage step problem. I, I, I loved your remark about it's not rotten apples, it's a rotten orchard, because that really points to the systemic character of the problem. And uh, everyone here of course will remember dear old Karl Marx. Uh, analyzing the, the reserve army of labor right. as, as a key element underpinning the whole function, the normal function of capitalism. The super exploitation 
of a group such as the, the students, the international workers who feel they've got no alternative but to just cop whatever wage the, uh, the boss is prepared to offer. It, it's, I mean, it, it's not a new problem, but it seems to me that it's grown in proportion exactly as the union movement has shrunk. And uh, as, as John pointed out, that embraced by the union movement of enterprise bargaining was, I think, a key moment in this process. Because, as we all remember, it was actually not Keating's doing, so much as the way in which Keating and the whole government responded to the demands from the stronger unions for enterprise bargaining. It was the stronger unions who thought they could do better it, it, under an enterprise bargaining regime. And what I think was the terrible mistake is that they set aside the class interest in favour of the sectional interest of particularly powerful groups of organised labour. It was, I think, John, you're absolutely right to point to that as, as a key turning point. And we can't get back from it, it seems. And, and the legacy is that labour in most industries and occupations is on the defence, vulnerable to all the sorts of problems you, you've outlined. But as you pointed out, we're in a COVID crisis. Everything is now up for grabs. What are we going to do? We can't suddenly imagine the union movement getting 50% coverage of the workforce again. It's just not going to happen. I mean, Maybe nudge it up a bit in some sectors, but that, that's not an option. So, so what is the way forward to a broader progress beyond sectional sort of defensive strategies to, to, a, to a, a, a more general, let's, let's call it socialist future? Can, can you give us a clue? <laughs> As you know, I, 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 I uh, uh, admire your analysis of the accord. I went through it when I was a student, and um, the things that said in my mind from your analysis were these, that underpinning the accord was the transfer from labour to capital, that the real wage overhang of those things, and that was a core tenet. That always was in my mind. Putting that aside, Let's focus on that enterprise bargaining aspect as a snap. Okay. People say you can't unscramble the egg. I'm not so sure about that particular point. I'll tell you why, in my view. The bosses are screaming at the moment that the reason for wage theft and the reason part of their problems is that it's all too complicated. Scamming the tax system with the high paid tax lawyers is quite easy for them. They're happy to go through reams of tax bills. But when it comes to paying their workers, it's all too complicated. And part of that complication, of course, is that you work for this outfit and they've got these allowances and these changes. You work for that outfit and they've got something different. The HR managers are confused, the bosses are confused, everything changes and it's all different. And there's all these little bits and pieces. We need something simpler. Well, let's marry a few things together. Let's join the dots. If we accept that wage theft principally harms the worker that has lost pay, that has had their wages stolen. But secondly, also rips off the competitors of the enterprise that is stealing wages. Because they're getting an unfair, and might say, illegal advantage over their competitors. Their competitor is paying by the minimum award standard. They are ripping off the system. Well, clearly, if things are that complicated and wage theft, they all agree, is a big problem, but it's just not their fault, well, surely the answer is industry-wide bargaining, particularly for those service sectors. Let's just start with one, the big problem. 
Maybe we'll see what, we'll play the boss's way. Let's see what happens after that. Why don't we simplify things for retail and, uh, and the related industries and have an industry-wide award, which is simpler, and the uni may have to cop some concessions there in terms of some of the better conditions in some areas. Start with that and go back to bargaining as an industry so that everyone knows what the deal is. There's no ripping off of not just the workers but also the other businesses. That's a serious call at the moment from the ACTU too, is industry-wide bargaining. That is one very good way in which we can tackle both aspects of wage theft but also redress some of the lost power. Um, through that enterprise bargaining system and how it went wrong, basically, and how it actually blew up in, in, in our faces. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that, okay, you're not going to get a no one wants another accord type situation. Let's, let's be clear, there has been discussions between the government and the ACTU groups and committees. No one expects them to deliver the workers' answer here or something that will progress the union movement necessarily. What it does say, though, is that is an acknowledgement on the part of government that they actually do need the unions around the table for the very reasons that I mentioned earlier. Because capital is not. Because capital is not. They are powerless. The drivers here are the workers. And they know that in a time of a crisis like this, they actually need the unions on board. It is the only reason that, and their attempt to say, we'll try to negotiate before they bring in the terrible legislation next year towards the end of the crisis. Which is why, if we want to position ourselves on the big questions, I would pick industry-wide bargaining. That would be the step that I would go. I would say that's first step in order to increase that density um, that you mentioned earlier, but also get to the grips again of being able to mobilise more along sort of like the class interests. As well as the peripheral areas, the related areas, superannuation is big. That is a big one. And we'll be doing a social media video shortly on who pays. Getting a discussion around the whole notion of who pays for this crisis. Because the government is already starting up this thing of, oh, it's going to be expensive. And you can see them angling towards a pre-austerity agenda, at least. Right? So debunking that notion that we have, we've borrowed money, our social media video includes some of us knocking on the doors of banks wanting to pay our $4,000 worth of the debt and can we get an early bird rate if we pay now, that kind of stuff. And the bank tells us, no, they didn't borrow from us, they didn't borrow from you. Well, who did they borrow of? They tell us we're in debt, but they can't tell us who they borrowed, the, you know, that sort of stuff. But to debunk the notion that somehow we're in debt. So I think them on the big questions, and I know it's only piecemeal stuff, but that is a practical thing in terms of power building and also structural change. One step too, there's going to be many, many, many more people in the world looking for wages that they can live on, but there are going to be much fewer jobs with automation, we've seen this in mining and all sorts of things, um, so there are less human beings involved, but we're not putting it into education, I mean education Oh no, that's an no, I live in an export industry. We can't afford to uh, uh, have cheaper um, costs for our own people. It's just going to be more expensive. And so this kind of, we should be putting much more money into education, which is um, like some private schools. It's uh, 14,000 a year to get a girl through um, particular school in the eastern suburbs, year 11 and 12, a girl without boarding pays 40,000 a year. Thanks. Okay, 
so there's two aspects to that. One in terms, sure, in terms of the education, vocational education and training. Very short term. Getting, getting free vocational education and training is just a must. We're almost there. And, and, I our, think, and our public schools are just... And, and, and our school funding. But in terms of that particular aspect, that also flows in actually into the whole wage lift and other things. We've, we've, come, we, we've gone into this discard, throw away kind of sort of society in terms of everything, including jobs. You get it for five minutes, you throw it away. You bring someone in for an Uber ride or someone for a quick job. It's become, it's become sort of like a dis labour is such a disposable asset now and, con and linked in with that sort of consumer mentality to boot. I think that it goes back into the whole argument about the reskilling and, and uh, 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 the whole skill formation agenda, which I think we're actually, that's going to be a big win. I can, I can feel that one coming on. I think we're going to win that. But we do need, obviously, obviously it will help, obviously, if Labor completes the job with it in terms of their policy, because the Liberal government is starting to do that in part. They can see that they've got no option. Can I tell you, I, I think it'll actually be because they'll have no option. They'll need to soak up young, unemployed people in their thousands. They will have no choice. One of my main criticisms I remember back to the white paper, which looking back is like the Bible, frankly. <laughs> have we drifted? Back in those days, Simon Crean said, uh, it was Erna Loom and the whole white paper, which focused on the obligation. Forget students having to pay for their education, they were obliged to go in and learn. Either work or go in and learn. And there wasn't payment of the vocational end, as I remember it, at that time. And the whole argument then was about that mutual obligation, whether it was a good or bad thing. I'd take that any day these days compared to what we've got. Mm -hmm. I can see something like that coming back. Briefly on automation, and it ties back on your point about the UBI. So, there's a currently a big dispute in Western Australia and Fremantle with a Labor government over there trying to get rid of the dock, establish a new port elsewhere and fully automate it. I won't go into all the details. Big job losses as a result through that automation. And there is this dichotomy between do you favour automation or not? I think the union movement has always had the answer to this question. It used to be called the shorter hours campaigns. It's not hard. You know, the, the dividends, the, the surpluses, the value that is taken out of that technology should be shared with Labor. It's not hard. It's always been the position, well, up until, well, as long as I can remember back, part of that, the union movement sort of position on this. And it was accompanied by the shorter hours movement. That was the whole point. In fact, that was the birth of the union movement in many ways around some of those notions. The idea, I think, is to is not to sever that link. It's to actually structurally change how automation comes in, the terms on which it comes in. And I think the debate we need to have isn't simply about we want some of that. I think the debate needs to be around where that technology comes from, the role of our public institutions, the role of every aspect of our social and physical infrastructure that delivers the automation to the bosses, and they should be taxed for it. And that tax should be the shorter hours for the workers. That's the social dividend back, which is actually an economic dividend for those workers, but socially for the country. That would be the alternative way to look at it instead of doing that through... The UBI approach could do it another way by simply taxing the boss and giving it to everyone. I acknowledge that would be one way of doing it. But that then severs that class relation, which I think is problematic. Anyway, that's a longer argument. Thank you. One more? Quick one? Yeah, yeah. But just really quick. So just on the narrative, the narrative again. But basically, we've, we've, um, capitalism, uh, we bailed it out 10 years ago with the GFC. 10 years later, we bailed it out again. We can't afford the rich. And I was <laughs> discussing last night. Discuss a lot. Like all these rich bastards are sitting around playing that they want to have rockets up to Mars or the moon and stuff. That's where the, you know, the guy who owns Amazon, that's what he's playing with now. He wants to get into the space. In relation to what you're talking about, narrative, 
most of the job tonight is we're getting good questions about um, automation and UBI and all that sort of stuff. Most of the jobs in the future for Australia are going to be in services. We're going to nationalise services. I, I would presume, I'm not an economist, the economist can help me out. I presume we're keeping the banks in business, I presume, with, uh, with job keeper and job seeker. But I, I'd say that's how people are paying their mortgages or paying their things. So we're, we're keeping them up to date. How do we move this, this narrative through to we can't afford the rich anymore? We've got, to, we've got to socialise or nationalise or whatever wording it is, services. It's going to be difficult in relation to mining and, and automation and stuff. That, I, don't, I think we probably, that's, that's a further down the track. But how do we move that? We need public, everyone's been, everyone knows nursing homes have to be public. Everyone knows that a, a key part of this, um, this process of, 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 of going through COVID is, is a well-educated population. We've been able to tell people, stay distance. Don't go near your, um, your grandmother. Stay away from that. That's been a key part of how we've done it. So public education has been based on that. Who could go past and have public health? The private health system fell apart. Though. It just fell apart. How, do we, how, in relation to the narrative, we can't afford the rich anymore and we need public services. Where do we go with that either? And that, I presume, would come through in the public sector. The union membership is much higher than in the public sector. It's going to improve on that too. So I'll, um, there's your last call. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Another easy one to finish up with. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, that's that's a head-on that's a head-on uh, narrative battle. It's happening now. It has been happening for quite some time. Let's face it. That COVID has put into focus. There's a complicating factor here too for the government, which is actually, in a sad way, but an acknowledged way, a strong card for us. The millions of jobs that they say they've created over the last 10 years, 15 years. Ironically, most of those are the ones that have taken out with COVID, the COVID crisis. Why? Because it just so happens that a lot of those were actually in the growth areas. Once you hollow out an economy. See, the irony here is a lot of the manufacturing places, we didn't stop making steel in Wollongong, not for a day. The manufacturing, the mines, all those things kept going. The bit that got taken out here and disrupted in a massive way were a lot of those service sector um, areas, the retail and hospitality and others that have seen a massive growth. That also happened to be a lot of the insecure work, casual, and um, um, in that sort of deregulated environment. So, some of those, well, no one's going to say that they want David Jones under public ownership. That's not going to be an argument that we're going to be having. But in terms of your nursing homes, in terms of re-looking really at the grid, if you like, and if there was something like a, one of those graphs where you had, you know, do you remember when you were going through school? I remember when I was going through school, we were given these graphs. And we were given a map of the world and say these were capitalist countries, these were communist countries, and these were mixed economies. And Australia was down as a mixed economy. Right? That's how we, that we, that's what we learned at school, right? And when at university and whatever, you'd have these sort of like graphs of the things that are in government control and state control, and we would have the rationale for those. Are they essential? Are they utilities? Are they natural monopolies? And there was a rationale for why you would do that. And then all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, but the economic, economic liberal sort of push, the Thatcher and the Reagan's, those sorts of pushes, changed and shifted that across. In broader terms, I think you're right. I think what we're now seeing is a lot of people, if not the government, questioning whether that shifted too far over here and whether it needs to move back. And one of the big arguments that we're going to have is what belongs in the public sector again. That, in a simplified sort of way, is I think where we're at. And the ones on the front line are clearly the things like nursing homes, health related and other ends where people have seen, have seen the effects of what happens when they're not in government. Even though it's complicated by the fact that they are technically regulated by the federal government, but they're not owned by the federal government and the federal government themselves will want to say it's not our fault. So the federal government's in the bind. They are funded. And you can start it by saying, well, if you're getting public funds, here's the rules. 
here's the staffing ratios, here's the, here's the wages. wages. Um, that's how you start that process. Yeah. And the government has already responded and fired its first shots at its own feet with Colbeck by saying, it's okay, 97% have done the right thing. It's just a few bad apples. Mm. Sorry, sorry, 400 dead, sorry. Sorry, it's just, it's only 3% of sorry. the nurses. That's gone down like a little balloon, as it should. So, and you're right, that's the, the question is, well, where's the accountability for those funds? And whether you go that next step in terms of direct ownership. And if they're there, what about, the, you know, a whole series of sectors now that could have effects. Imagine if, if it was a different kind of crisis or a different kind of emergency, all of those things would have come up again in that process. But it won't happen just by us assuming that it's going to happen. That's a narrative we have to build. The government's not going to start that fight. But it's not in their interest to do that. We have to move on that and push that. And frankly, we need some help in the parliamentary end too. Labor has to push that too. In fact, I think that is, it's been one of the criticisms, I think, of Labor, that they've been a yeah. bit quiet through this. Um, yes, Labor's response to that would be, well, we're all in it together. They don't want to be seen to be, you know, not being part of the team. Well, I think we're now at a point where the guns are out, right? Let's face it. Sorry to extend that before now. Alex. The guns are out now. Well, now it's time. Now we really need to see where the alternative views are. And you're right, that is one of the big questions. How far do we shift that pendulum? And clearly the government's not going to go anywhere near it if Labor doesn't. They're going to go, you know, they'll try and do the footsie. Yeah. Yeah.